Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. Thanks, sponsors, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, ComC.com, Burbank Sports Cards, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Heritage Auctions, Hugs and Scott Auctions, Tops, Upper Deck, and Panini. This is an outtake episode from Hobby Hotline of a week and a half ago on that first Saturday of the month in the morning. They say it's the hobby's only live call-in show and certainly enjoy the interaction with the uh, listeners and viewers on that. Danny Black was uh, the co-host handling the uh, comments and stuff like that. And Mike Moynihan and I were on for the first half and then Mike uh, dropped off and Rich Klein came on discussion about 10 xing the hobby and what it means. There's some interesting insights there that you'll enjoy because making sense of that is the road we're headed on. And if it's done right, it's going to be wonderful. If it's done wrong, it's not a good thing. So 10 xing not as simple as what you think. It's achievable in many of the things we're going to bring up here. It is achievable in a reasonable way. Thanks, everybody. And here is the interesting discussion. Always encourage you to go straight to Hobby Hotline when it comes out, <laughs> because then you'll get it fresh and uh, very spontaneous. That's what I like about it. It's not scripted. We go into things. Who knows what we're going to go into, but it's always interesting and always fun. So thanks. And here it is. Speaking of Panini, they lost the UFC license this week to Fanatics and Tops. Now, I know that UFC and WWE have merged as one company, but it's still two different licenses, is my understanding, and WWE has not transferred yet. But the UFC is now going to come out from tops later this month. Is that big news that UFC is moving? Or is it's it... always big news, but remember, WWE already has a contract at some point to go to finale. Right. So it's big news, but it's not unexpected big news. No, it's big news, but it's news that was negotiated because Tops had to be already in the works. So this is not a, a split second decision. This is the way it's going. And Panini, whether there was any consideration, you're not hearing a lot of name calling, but it sounds like they pulled the rug out from under him. And in reality, I think there were discussions because of all this other litigation. They don't need to have litigation. If somebody wants to leave at the end of their contract or make a change, there's usually provision for that. The fact that it wasn't rancorous makes me think they've worked it out. If they're going to release later this month, when did the production of that set really have to start? Six months ago. The UFC is a little smaller than baseball in terms of the amount of people in its own. You might be able to have a shorter timeline even in six months to get a set ready. When Fanatics is going to 10X, the hop, that also means having the capability, I know with all the people they've hired in the last year that had a lot of experience, they're probably able to speed up the uh, product development cycle. If you're going to do 10X, you can't be taking a year to, to contemplate making the perfect product. I feel they're starting to get uh, revved up to be able to produce things quicker. And that, that's and an example. And as I say, you have a smaller universe in UFC than you do in baseball or football or even basketball of people in the sport. But if you have 160 people signed to UFC, that's a pretty easy number to whittle down from. If, you are, if you're whittling to 100 from 160, that's not that hard. I would also assume not having the team name, the team logos, and that approval process on all the cards has to speed it up to some degree. Fast forward in the next couple of years. You're going to be able to put these sets together, the basic set by AI. Yeah. Grab this photo, frame it in there, put in the name, the, the team or, or the nickname or something like that. Write up a back. AI can do all that stuff. I, I really feel like the, the complications in uh, product development are not the photos and the names and the art design. That can all be automated. What's tricky are the autographs, whether they're stickers or on card. That's what takes time game used or match used things. That's what takes time. But Tops Now and Panini Instant, you want a card? If it's just ink on paper, you can get a card. I but mean, insert Panini ratios Instant. and all that stuff, that's what's tricky. Fanatics having the leagues as as investors, should you would think smooth over the process of getting athletes to sign? Because the players union are going to be investors as well, going on the road and getting somebody into their hotel room to find a batch of cards. Is only going to get easier. For Dr. Beck, how do you define 10x in the hobby? Because that term has, been, has become the throwaway line now. I was going to do a podcast about that, but I guess maybe I won't now. <laughs> just capture <laughs> this. But basically, there's a book that just came out by Dan Sullivan, who's actually the 
executive coach of one of my mentors, so he's a very top-notch executive coach. The, the title of the book is something like 10X is Easier Than 2X. I don't know if Michael Rubin's read the book or is in the book. I haven't got the book, but it's just coming out. Basically, the thesis, I think, is that if you have a lofty goal like that, you think big. And so the 10X is going to take time. You'll take some incremental gains, but you're thinking big. And so to me, that's international. It's broadening the market, widening the audience. I hope it's not 10Xing the price or 10Xing the production of the basic sets that we've come to know and love and that have an equilibrium with supply and demand. They've got to keep that. They've got to still treat it like a collectible. So 10X is not just a slogan. It's an approach to thinking big. I guess I just did that podcast in about 60 seconds. It's at the point now, Fanatics has a different business model. I think the active players, associations, leagues like that business model better. They're going to get a cut. They're buying into the 10X. They want to be with the underdog. Panini was the disruptor. When Panini came in and they did all these parallels and all this color and all that stuff, that took especially basketball to the next level by adding these complications. And, and Rich and I, we know the guys. So that really increased the market. It probably 10 x basketball over the last 10 or 15 years. But now F Fanatics is going to be the enduring incumbent. They're also doing the disrupting. And they've assumed market leadership pretty quickly. And so Panini is a distant second now in the perception going forward of collectors. Jim is right about Panini really exploding the basketball card market. Dr. Beck, you just made the comment about basketball growing so much and Panini growing that. The women's basketball and the women's cards have exploded in the last couple of years. Kaylin Clark Superfractor just set a record of $78,000, most expensive women's basketball card of all time. With the popularity in the WNBA, but really college products and college stars, is this a, a growth area? Women's basketball players are now finally getting the publicity they always should have had. Guys, basketball, I, I, this, I don't want to make this a newsflash, but basket, NBA basketball cards are not going to 10X. They've already 10X'd. Women's basketball can 10X. Like I said, I think that's fanatics mindset. College cards in general, Bowman U, pre-professional cards, that can 10X. Soccer can probably still 10X. Non-sport entertainment can 10X. TCGs, I'm not sure they can 10X. Because they've already had this huge increase. Like the Wayne Gretzky, look to what hasn't done their 10X already. Football probably can't 10X. Baseball can't 10X because numbers are already too big. And I don't think you're going to get 10 times as many baseball card collectors, but you could get 10 times as many collectors. The WNBA doesn't pay as much as it does for the women who go over and play in Europe. I wonder with NILs and, and advertising for the marketing that the players can do now, that it helps you know, offset their income to where they can stay in the States. Because I think that'll really be what grows the game. Is the Not just stay in the States, they stay in college. If they can't afford to go pro because their NIL money, Caitlin Clark, she's not in a hurry to get to the WNBA. When she gets there, she may set a new standard, but I think there's a salary scale there. And when you have these mega stars, it's going to disrupt that. And that's fine. Hopefully the pie will get bigger so the players can get a proportionate share of a bigger pie. The pile is getting bigger, albeit a little more slowly than some sports, but after what happened with Brittany Griner, the, they realized they had to pay more money to their players. So the salaries have gone up considerably because they don't want people going back to Russia to get detained again. What happened with her became a red flag for WNBA players. Egg on their okay. face for sure. But you know what? When you're looking at the WNBA, is there any WNBA game now? Even the, the final, uh, the, the last game of the finals, is that a hotter ticket than anything Iowa right now? I don't think so. And fuego. so I'm just saying, so it's flipped. And so anybody thinks, ah, if it's a college card, not a big deal. High school card, not a big deal. It's got to be in their pro uniform. That is being disrupted right now by Caitlin Clark and others 
So be careful what you think will always be true. Women's basketball may be the most successful Bowman U product. On secondary market sale of one well, cars, yeah. <laughs> but that drives, that'll be sold out. So no, and there are other good cards in there. If all of a sudden somebody starts covering Caitlin's Clark's professional games with seriousness, then you know women's basketball has really arrived. They're already doing it with their college games. She's getting primetime billing. When she goes on the road, the road teams are selling out and with lines work down the street and around the building. And Dr. Beckett's right. There's not a hotter ticket in, in, in the WNBA than Caitlin Clark is right now in college. So that correlates with the hobby. There's a popularity there. The men's college game and March Madness was always a bigger deal than a regular season NBA game, maybe not the finals, but the college game is really interesting. In it, the pros, they play the same teams over and over again every year. You catch them when they come in town. I've had season tickets. It's not a bad thing, but this is a, a singular moment when Caitlin Clark breaks the record, as Rich says, which will happen in a couple of weeks, in a week or two. Rich? She has nine games uh, left, I believe. She's she's a, a hundred she points, like three or four games. Leaf acquired press pass. I noticed they also picked up the Professional Bowlers Association license. I also didn't mention Volvo's down shop. Metazoo, speaking of trading card games, Steve Aoki was one of the partners in that. They've closed their doors. And I wonder if that'll actually add secondary value to their cards or if they'll just disappear into the abyss. Yeah, There's the old rule. If nobody's playing the game at the time, 20 years from now, everybody will say, hey, wait a second, these cards are really rare or rarer. Let's buy them. So there's always that long-term play. A real long-term, maybe, on that one. The one thing about Leaf, it demonstrates that Leaf was not Brian Gray only. That there's some creative people over at, at Leaf, even though the company was founded or formed in Brian's image, it's now moving forward with Brian's same kind of aggressiveness of trying to acquire underappreciated assets. And I want Leaf to be successful. I'd like for the press brand to be resurrected because I think there's some legacy there. I'm in favor of those things. I, I think it shows the vibrancy of the hobby. The hobby's always been this, what's going on now, but then there's always a nostalgic thing. And even though we don't think the press pass is vintage, it's vintage in the eyes of a lot of the collectors because it's old. Our good friend Kyle Robertson is doing a non-sports card show at the Waters Creek Convention Center next weekend. I will be there to walk around. Obviously, that's not a place where I'm going to go dime box hunting or dollar box hunting or quarter box hunting because there's going to be no sports cards. But it should be fun to see how the other half lives. I tried to get Valentine's points with Diane for not going to the show, Rich. I said, there's a show the weekend before Valentine's Day. And sweetheart, I just wanted you to know I'm not going. That's a good one. But <laughs> I go to the office and if I show up at the office, I can walk there. So it's a little harder for me. However, I will be watching the Super Bowl that right. same weekend. You're not opening Top Series 1? No, or... I'm not opening Top Series 1 on whatever that is Wednesday. Okay. I got it down, Danny. I'm ready. Let this be a good reminder for everybody. If you have not bought your Valentine's Day cards, as I am just remembering, we are 11 days. So, no, no, no. Did you you Freudian slip that? You said if you have not bought your Valentine's Day cards. <laughs> oh, <laughs> to be, Dan, what have you got on the side, young man? What, who's your side piece of this? To clear it up before we leave, I buy one funny card and one romantic card okay. every year. So that's okay. why I said cards. Okay. You're going to get me in trouble, guys. The man in the house of cards.